The Rockwell XFV-12 was a revolutionary aircraft design that featured canard wings in the front, a slung back swept main wing, and, most importantly, vertical takeoff launch capabilities, otherwise known as VTOL. In addition to this, it was hoped to be a Mach 2 capable fighter aircraft, which would make it among the fastest of its type ever created, even today. It was to be equipped with numerous anti-air missiles, as well as a 20mm Vulcan cannon, similar to the one on the F-4 Phantom II, and would operate from sea control ships, a small aircraft carrier concept that would have supplemented contemporary fleet carrier forces. The high performance and, at times, exotic XFV-12 promised a bright future for supersonic VTOL fighters, but never took off. This is the story of the XFV-12, the VTOL that could not VTOL. The XFV-12's development started in 1972 when the Navy issued a request for proposals for a next generation supersonic VTOL-ESTOL fighter-slash-attack aircraft. Development on VTOLs had been occurring for many years by this point, as there was a great fear of war and the likely need in such an event to take off from nearly anywhere, as airports and airstrips would be among the first targets for destruction. This said, several designs have been created, with fewer such designs actually being built and fewer still being considered a success. Among the first military designs was the Faka Axelis FA-269, which was a German VTOL project conceived in 1941, with an estimated completion date by 1947. This, of course, never occurred, as World War II ended before this plane could be created. Future work had continued beyond World War II, being spurred on by the threat of nuclear annihilation during the Cold War. The 1950s proved to be a time of great progress towards VTOL designs, whereas the 1960s and 70s saw those designs come to fruition, largely due to advancing technology that would allow for VTOL planes to be practical. As such, experimental planes such as the Dornier DO-31, the Ryan X-13 Vertijet, and Convair XFY Pogo were being built with varying degrees of success. Not until the famous Hawker Harrier and later the Yak-38 was it that practical and production-ready planes were being created, although one could make the argument that the aforementioned Dornier DO-31 was not far from production. The issue with the Yak and Harrier was that, while they were perfectly capable, they were subsonic and not incredibly well-suited for the rigors of air-to-air -air combat, and thus were largely relegated to ground attack missions with the option for anti-air. This limitation in part became the main impetus for the creation of a new, supersonic, air superiority VTOL fighter for the U.S. Navy. Both Rockwell and Convair submitted plans for this project, with the Rockwell XFV-12 beating Convair's Model 200 for the prize, even despite its unconventional design. Because the initial design was to be a proof of concept that would eventually become a fighter plane, it became a parts bin aircraft of sorts, selecting the nose of the already existing A-4 Skyhawk and the intakes of the F-4 Phantom II. It was also to use the F-401 PW-400 jet engine, a variant of an engine already being created and developed for planes like the F-15 and F-16. In 1974, however, trouble began occurring during the development process, as wind tunnel tests showed that the likely output from the engine would be insufficient for VTOL, but would still be more than sufficient for a conventional aircraft, even with the unconventional design of the plane. The issue with the miscalculated downward thrust came from both miscalculations in the thrust itself during development, owing largely to this being a pioneering technology and to the fact that computational fluid dynamics was still a burgeoning field without the aid of modern computer modeling, and was also due to the complicated and extensive ductwork that greatly sapped the thrust aimed downwards for VTOL operations. As a result, though the engine produced more than enough thrust in its normal configuration, where it flows out of the rear of the plane, it only had about 75% of the power required to lift the entirety of the plane while in VTOL mode. The runway taxi trials had occurred and by this time the plane was both built and fully functional sans its VTOL capabilities. The Navy in 1981 decided to cut funding before a flight could ever take place. This was after the Navy had already axed a second prototype from being built. Although the XFV-12 could have been an excellent fighter in the traditional role and without VTOL capabilities, the Navy decided to move forward with more conventional planes that were simultaneously being made and developed, such as the FA-18 and its precursor aircraft. Because its unique design and the wings that were both exotic and complicated, of which opened like Venetian blinds to direct the thrust downwards, 
the XFV-12 was simply too far ahead of its time. Because the XFV-12 was not accepted into service, it created a void that has largely been left unfilled by any aircraft since its initial development as, until recently, supersonic VTOL production aircraft were simply experimental. Until the F-35B Lightning II in 2015, no nation has accepted any supersonic VTOL plane into service. Even still, at Mach 1.6, the modern stealth F-35 cannot match the top speed that was estimated from the XFV-12, which was planned to be able to reach between Mach 2.2 and Mach 2.4. More so, owing to its design, it was likely to have been a phenomenal fighter, due to its wing shape and layout that would create instability in turns. Though the XFV-12 did not take flight despite being built and ready for operation, it has largely served as a stark reminder that not all things go to plan even when having the best and brightest minds on your side. The fully built prototype of the XFV-12 has largely been disassembled and destroyed, but the cockpit survived and has recently been restored by high school students with the assistance of NASA personnel and will be made into a museum display upon completion. But that said, thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you have not done so already. For now, I will be primarily producing War Thunder content, but I thoroughly enjoy making history videos and educating people on the obscure parts of history, especially involving military operations. That said, thanks again for watching everyone, and take care.